six strings. E, B, G, D, A, E. That's been my home for the last 15 or so years, and I've played seven string guitars before, and I've enjoyed it, but I never felt I was really getting anything extra out of it. For lack of a better term, I found that I was playing somewhat generically when I used them. All I'd do is take a riff that I'd normally play on a six string, and then I'd just play that same way, but on the seven string. it was tuned lower and you could say it sounds heavier but for me that didn't really even fit the style of music that I play I don't play metal I play rock and hard rock and seven strings aren't really as popular in that genre so it was just never really useful for me there so seven strings weren't going to be for me and that's where I left it until I saw the White Snake 1990 Live at Donington recording. On its own, it's a masterclass in how to put on a great rock gig, but it's so much more than that. It's also a masterclass by Steve Vai, showcasing how to use a seven string in conjunction with a six string in a hard rock context. It was 1990, so Vai had just released the first commercially available seven string in conjunction with Ibanez, the Ibanez universe, and he needed to showcase its uses on a big stage. And this was his opportunity. Now I can't play you any of the concert, but it is linked in the description if you want to take a look. But what I can do is play some guitar parts for the example. This track is called Crying in the Rain, and normally it would be two six strings playing the same six string riff. But in this case, it was one six string and one seven string, which allowed Vi to use the extended lower range of the seven string. And I thought it sounded quite cool. <laughs> If you're familiar with the original song, you'll notice that the seven string really changes the whole vibe of things, and I quite liked that. And it got me thinking, maybe I should revisit the seven string. Maybe I should try and play it in a way that complements a six string. I was talking with Greg from Vola Guitars about this idea, and Vola were kind enough to send me out a seven string Oz guitar to try this on. So a huge thanks to Vola for sending this out and in part sponsoring this video by way of sending this out. And there's a link to their store in the description and if you want 5% off you can use code KDH at checkout. But with this idea of having a seven string to complement a six string part I had to put this idea into practice. And my band Walker had a song ready to record called Famous that was a six string part. It was a very simple six string riff it sounded like this. <laughs> Now I'm already a big fan of two guitars playing different but very similar riffs, panned left and right, and I, I think that adds a lot to a recording. So why not do that but with a seven string? Use that lower register to complement the simple riff, maybe add in a couple extra notes and see what happens. So here's what it sounds like. <laughs> I liked that, and we had four hours of studio time booked, so I think it was time to record. Uh, but first, we should probably restring the guitar. So we're recording this evening, and before you record, it's always recommendable to change your strings. And I thought it would be a little bit rude for me not to include you on a restring, because I always include you on the restrings. So here we are. Just a quick one today. It's a nice gig bag. 
I'm just going to leave it on the case because this is a quick restring. We don't actually have a whole lot of time to do this. Seven strings this time. Watch this. There you go. Strings cut. World didn't end. We're fine. Now, it's recommendable to restring before you record because when you get a fresh set of strings, you know the way they're a lot brighter? They, they sound a lot brighter. And that might not be what you want when recording. But you can always just... EQ that out, roll, tone down, whatever you want to remove that brightness. But you can't do an awful lot to add it. I think it's better to be in the position to be able to remove what you don't need rather than need something and not have it. Especially in the recording studio situation where time is literally your money because you're paying to be there. So better to have everything that you need and just EQ it out if you don't need it than not have it. There you are. Merry Christmas to somebody, and make sure to like and subscribe. This is a seven string pack of Daddario 10s. Uh, I did order a pack of 11s, but they have not come. So we're making do with what we have, and it should be fine because I use 10s in D standard a lot anyway. Editor's note, it was in fact not fine. Uh, the low B was a little bit too loose with the 10s. I would use 11s at the minimum in the future for D standard with a 7 string at 25.5 inch scale. Anyway, I'm going to restring this. Just thought I'd include you. And let's go to the studio. <laughs> Just get a level sorted for you. You guys ready? Yep. Yep. Just to have a run through, just to get him a level. Like. One, two, three, four. Only consistent when his tune keeps changing. Now you're doing nothing. Yeah, I mean, we're racing. Yeah. I think we need to up the tempo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 109, try 109. Yeah. What was that? Different lick coming out of that the was 105. Somewhere. Okay. But I had to click on 210. So I should probably give you some additional context to what's going on here in case you don't record the same way we do or you've never recorded at all. So what we're doing here is two things at once. The first thing is we're recording drums. James is in the live room and he's recording the actual drum sound. It's literally it. <laughs> But at the same time, the rest of the band are playing just a guide track. You don't really put your all into a guide track, it is purely just a guide, a reference for the rest of the recording. So the vocals are just there to indicate where you are in the song. It's not the full performance, Glenn isn't giving all he's got there, because it's going to get deleted at the end. Same with the guitars and the bass, this is just a guide track at the moment. I'm just being cautious about blowing my voice. First one you do. Do, do, do. One two 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 one two one two. I think that's yep. enough now, James. Wait, wait, wait. One two exactly. one two. Two two two. <laughs> Now after James is done recording his drums, we then record our instruments individually. And you can do this in any order you'd like, but we like to have bass next because it's nice to have the rhythm of the song done. And it's also a very quick process in this case because Pete, the bass player, is very, very consistent. Normally does it in one take, one take and a couple punch-ins at the max. So um, it's good because it's very quick and we're on a tight, limited time. <laughs> Yeah. 
And after that we record guitars, and normally the person who's doing the solo, in this song it's me, will go last. So in this case, Glenn is going to start doing his rhythm. <laughs> Quick word on the guitar gear that we were using, uh, Glenn was using the Gibson Hair Pole into a Marshall 30th Anniversary head, which sounded really cool, and then into a Mesa Boogie V30 loaded cab. It does. It does. It's really nice. Was that more than a half take, Glenn? That was. Yeah. That was one on a do do, Glenn. And he, was, he only made a mistake because your dad only fell over the coffee table. <laughs> <laughs> so, with Glenn's guitar recorded, all the six string rhythm done, it was then my turn to lay down the seven string side. And the gear that we were using was the Vola Oz seven string. And then that was all for the rhythms. Then for the solo, I used the studio's Charvel, making use of the Floyd Rose. And then all of that was going into a Marshall JCM 800, little combo JCM 800 from the 80s. And then that was running through a Marshall 412. One, two, three, four. Only <laughs> Can you give me a left, a panned left track? Towards the end when it starts double timing, there starts to be like a kind of background, background solo. Yeah. And at this point in the recording, we are running tight on time. A little bit stressful. But it's time to record the vocals. So that's mainly Glenn's job. Whoa, whoa, whoa. One, two, three, four. Only consists when this tune keeps changing. It might be cool, it might be amazing. But you know it's only fame that he's chasing. I think we'll get vocals done. Stop jinking us. Stop. Stop, Stop it. Jinky, shut, shut up. When I'm jinking, I'm jinking. Jinky is good. <laughs> Jinkle bells, good. <laughs> Sounded shit to me. Don't drop on the last note, just keep it up. Hello, Okay. But yeah, but is that even. Am I even saying the. It's cool, yeah, it's cool, though. Yeah, if he's gonna write session, then get the Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone loves it, you go far. Night twisters might be cool, it might be amazing. But you know it's only fair. 
we got the song recorded right on time. A, a minute past 11. It was The session was 7 till 11. And uh, I'd love to be able to play you the finished song at the moment. Unfortunately, it's just, it's not finished. Because it's not mixed, it's not mastered, and it's not released even yet. So, this is just a sneak peek. Uh, and even the guitars, the guitar tones, are not necessarily going to stay the exact same. Because... The producer that's recording a track mix is Michael Richards, and he's the guy who does all the Joey Sturgis impulse responses. So he knows what he's talking about when it comes to guitar tones. And it's not uncommon in the mixing process to decide that maybe a different amp or a different cabinet might suit the overall mix better. So when we're recording, we're also recording a DI of the guitar that we can then reamp through amps and cabinets to suit the mix better. So at the moment we've recorded six songs but we've used a huge amount of different amps on them. That probably will not stay the same. It'll probably be a lot more consistent for the guitar tones to remain pretty consistent throughout because we've used Mesomark 5, EVH 5150, uh, the Marshall 30th anniversary, two different JCM 800s um, and an orange AD30. So a lot of different things and then there's like three different cabinets we've ran through so it's probably going to be slimmed down to a little bit more of a consistent bunch by the end of the overall mix and master of the full album so i can't play you the finished song right now but i can play you a little bit of studio footage where we are listening to the song and you can kind of hear how everything's coming together seven string on one side six string on the other I'm a big fan of this this idea using some seven strings to complement six strings. I think it's I think it's got something. Uh, Steve Vai was right. So that's the video. Big thank you to Vola for sending out the seven string. Thank you for watching. Subscribe if you want to. Uh, follow me on Instagram KDH Guitar TV. Um, and you can even follow the Walker band profile there. You can see some updates when we're recording and such. Album coming soon with some seven string on it. Anyway, I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.